Dear attendees of the CLINAM conference, it's my pleasure to announce the pharmaceutical development and manufacturing session that's also co-performed um, with the APV um, Association. Um, the first speaker is going to be um, Peter von Hockefest, uh, head of scientific department at Lipoid GmbH in Ludwigshafen to talk about large scale GMP production of liposomes. Peter, the stage is yours. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Ben, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to give a seminar on the large scale production of, of liposomes. As you know, liposomes are not only liposomes, but there are many types of liposomes, which is depicted here in this slide. There are small unilamellar uh, liposomes, large unilamellar liposomes, and multilamellar uh, vesicles and multivesicular vesicles. So the methods you would like to produce would be adapted to the type of particle you would like to uh, produce. Um, liposomes are at, at the moment quite popular, also a nanotechnology, uh, because they are very versatile in terms of uh, selection of uh, drugs, which can be incorporated in, in uh, the liposomes. Uh, um, so water-soluble uh, lipophilic drugs and amphiphilic drugs can be incorporated. They can be used for solubilization of these lipophilic drugs. They can protect, uh, protect API for degradation. They are mainly used at the present for drug targeting, so reducing side effects, toxicity of the API, um, in order to increase the therapeutic index of the API, and they are also being used for sustained release. At the moment, we have um, different type of carriers uh, available in um, at least uh, 20 to 30 products which are on the, on the market, mainly parenteral products uh, which of interest uh, for um, this audience which are, uh, for instance, SUVs uh, for stabilization purposes of uh, tightly um, encapsulating the drugs uh, to carry them efficiently to uh, tumor uh, targets. Uh, you can also use SUVs for solubilization and LUVs for long circ uh, circulating uh, liposomes. You can also have LUVs uh, without peculation, MLVs, um, for macrophage targeting, uh, you can here find the products which are relevant for these purposes. Uh, Multifascicular liposome, slow release, and also at the moment, um, as we will be communicated in other presentations, at the moment, uh, lipid nanoparticles are uh, very popular. Uh, the main component of phospholipids is uh, phospholipid like lecithin. Lecithin is uh, uh, considered as having a very low toxicity after oral intake and also after parental uh, intake. It is considered as a uh, low tox uh, excipient and uh, for that reason liposomes are um, very um, versatile carriers. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, liposomes can be considered in nanotechnology as a benchmark carrier for other nanoparticles because they are used uh, many years. The phospholipids, as I already mentioned, are safe for parental um, administration. Um, several phospholipids are available, a large scale, which is very important for products. And at the moment, there are many parental products that accept the regulatory authorities. And at the moment, there is uh, much attention being paid to the use of liposomes as part of uh, gene therapy, and especially because of the, the COVID-19 um, crisis uh, for vaccination purposes. So in order to produce these particles on a large scale, uh, you have to realize what sort of physical chemical properties your drug substance has in order to make them compatible with the liposome. So the water solubility is important. You should know the solubility in sol solvents, the partition coefficients, pKa properties, formation of salts, and the stability, of course. Uh, also, in, in order to design the correct production process for, for the, the product you would like to uh, produce, um, you have to know what sort of lipids you're going to use, which sort of target particle size is important for your product, the zeta potential, 
Do you want to have passive targeting by means of stealth effect by adding peculated lipids? Do you want to solubilize um, uh, lipophilic drugs and liposomes, or do you want to use it for slow release purposes? So all these factors de uh, define which process you're going to use. So <clears throat> uh, I will now uh, inform you a little bit on, on uh, many production options which exist nowadays of producing liposomes at GMP large scale. Uh, the, these schedules are derived from, from patent literature and general scientific uh, literature. So the classical production of uh, incorporating hydrophilic drugs, so water-soluble drugs in liposomes is that you mix in uh, the solution of the drug with uh, dry lipids mix. You, you mix them um, when needed on the high shear in order to make a crude uh, liposome dispersion. You can further downsize the liposomes in order to make them uh, sterile filterable so that you get the SUVs with this uh, 50 to 200 nanometer particle size. Then you remove the non-encapsulated water-soluble drug by means of dialysis. You perform sterile filtration in case you would like to administer that parentally. And when needed, when the drug or the lip lipids are not stable enough, you could further freeze them. Another option to incorporate hydrophilic drugs is um, uh, using a uh, uh, solvent uh, dilution procedure by um, dissolving the lipids in a water based solvent, like, for instance, ethanol. You mix that on the controlled conditions with an aqueous solution of the drug. You get them due to the dilution and liposome dispersion. You dialyze, you can, by controlling the dilution uh, conditions, you can uh, manipulate uh, the size of the liposomes. Then you remove the non encapsulated drug by dialysis. You perform sterile filtration, and when needed, you can further freeze dry them. Um, another option to incorporate um, drugs, uh, hydrophilic drugs, which are either a weak base or a weak acid, is uh, for using a remote loading procedure. So you make first, uh, let's say, empty placebo liposomes in a certain medium, which is needed to load the drug into the liposomes by means of a pH gradient, for instance. So you disperse the lipids in uh, this medium with a certain pH, for instance. You get a crude liposome dispersion. You can downsize the liposomes. So the, the, the dialysis is performed to remove the non encapsulated, um, the, the, sorry, to remove the, the pH which you would like to um, have established in order to load the drug through a pH gradient. So you add the drug, the liposome, the drug has been taken up by, by the liposomes due to the pH gradient. You can then crack the pH, sterile filter, and then freeze dry when possible. So this is a third option to make uh, liposomes cytophilic drugs. For lipophilic drugs, you can dissolve lipids and drugs both in the same solvent, evaporate them. That's the classical mixed film um, method. Basically, you get a drug lipid uh, film. You disperse this in order to make a crude liposome dispersion. You downsize them by means of membrane extrusion or high pressure homogenization. You get the liposome dispersion, sterile filter them, freeze dry them. This is a, a classical method which is not convenient for very large scale. So there are better methods now, which uh, uses again the organic solvent dilution method by, for instance, dissolving the drug and lipids in a water miscible solvent like ethanol. You dilute them. Uh, this phase with the aqueous phase, you get automatically liposomes in which the lipophilic drug is incorporated. You sterile filter them and you freeze dry them when needed. So the phospholipids are the, the key components of uh, liposomes. Without phospholipids, you don't have uh, liposomes. So these are the main uh, phospholipids being used. You can play with the, the charge and lipophilicity of these compounds in order to design a proper liposome. So phospholipids, you find also on other um, um, products like for oral, parenteral, topical skin, and pulmonary. And, um, and you can mainly also find them, of course, in the liposomes, which you, they are also being used in emulsions, mixed micelles, and dispersions for drug delivery purposes. 
the sources for lipids, uh, phospholipids are either from vegetable source like soybean sunflower, uh, sunflower or from animal source like egg yolk and synthetic phospholipids produced from either from mannitol, from, from scratch, but pure uh, synthetic uh, chemistry or you can also enzymatically prepare them from uh, highly purified uh, natural phospholipids. As the FDA is considering phospholipids as uh, APIs because they um, dictate what's happening with the drug when you encapsulate that in uh, an liposome. So it is very important that you have a uh, control on the quality of the phospholipids by means of CGMP production of the, of the phospholipids and uh, on the ISO uh, 9001, etc., with all these quality systems which are now in place, produce these compounds. Two minutes. Um, the question is um, what, what sort of lipids are being used? We have synthetic and natural phospholipids. The synthetic phospholipids you mainly find in liposomes and suspensions and pulmonary use, whereas other uh, administration routes uh, use mainly natural phospholipids and eggs or you know, nitrogenated source. So the, in this table, you find the lipids which are nowadays available. Um, for formulation purposes, which are established by um, uh, regulatory authorities and, and accepted by them. And so I can conclude that uh, the large scale production of liposomes is uh, very well established nowadays. Uh, the production process of the liposome can be adapted to the physical chemical properties of the drug substance. Uh, also, the key components of liposomes, the phospholipids, are available at pharmaceutical quality and at large scale. And natural as well as synthetic phospholipids can be used for liposomes. And um, Lipoid is recommending a rational selection regarding the large scale availability um, before um, the development of such products, which may need either small or large quantities of uh, phospholipids for these products. So thank you for your attention. Perfect, Peter. So um, we can now start the discussion. Um, I'm just checking whether we have any questions, not yet. Please submit them uh, in the question um, module. So we have one question. Um, does this work for oral delivery, Peter? Uh, question regarding production of liposomes is this irrespective for which administration route, of course. But uh, the question whether you can liposomes for oral use, that's a completely different uh, question. Uh, my opinion is that liposomes are per se as liposomal structure not. Uh, playing a role for oral delivery. There's mainly the phospholipids which are being used in as solubilizers uh, because as soon as you ingest liposomes, they are being dissolved and degraded uh, by bile and uh, enzymes like phospholipases in the gut. So the liposomes do not play a major role as delivery vehicle. Uh, after oral administration, but phospholipids as part of oral dosage form could play a role as part uh, of um, a solubilizer to increase the bioavailability of lipophilic uh, oral compounds. Okay, um, so we have two questions now. Um, what kind of quality control methods do you use for release of the phospholipids? Well, the, a lot of phospholipids are now being described in the United States pharmacopoeia and the European pharmacopoeia and uh, classical methods like peroxide number content by means of HPLC, the lysolecithin content could be important, the acid number and all sort of the, this sort of essays you can find. And I would like to refer to the monographs of uh, the USP and the EP for getting more information on this. Um, thank you. The next question 
collaboration or CMO from Scott McNeil. How do you handle IP? Is it shared or entirely owned by the sponsor? Yeah, uh, from Lipoid is an excipient uh, supplier and is not developing um, itself um, liposomal products. So we are a supplier of uh, excipients which are basically free of, of IP and there are no, no problems of using these. Thank you. And then the next question is on oxidation by Ranaldo Digigov. Uh, what is the best solution to avoid oxidation of phospholipids and liposomes? Yeah, that's quite simple. Just keep them under nitrogen or and, and or uh, add antioxidants like alpha tocopherol or EDTA to, to block uh, the cation catalyzed uh, oxidation. But the usual trick is to, to keep uh, aqueous dispersions of liposomes under nitrogen or even argon. Thank you. There's a question on regulatory pathway by Michael Keller. Would you think that it would be beneficial to have a specific regulatory pathway for nanopharmaceuticals? Uh, no, um, yes or no. I mean, uh, nanopharmaceuticals is a very, very broad area. I mean, the FDA actually released quite a lot of uh, these sort of uh, guidelines and discussion papers on what sort of methods uh, should be used to characterize these. So I think the regulatory authorities are working hard on this and are already on the respective web pages of the EMA and uh, uh, FDA so-called reflection papers available, um, which you can find a lot of suggestions to harmonize the quality control of nanoparticles and nano delivery systems. Thanks a lot, um, Peter. Um, now it's time for switching to the next topic. So the next speaker will be um, Dr. Wouter Müllers um, from a pharmaceutical technology scout working at Bayer AG in Berlin. Um, here we are. Wouter, the stage is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bernd, for the and introduction and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give my talk here. Um, my talk of today is called Delivery of New Modalities, Recent Technology Trends and Solutions. I will share some of the new drug delivery technologies available for new modalities with a strong focus on oral peptide delivery. My name is Walter Müller. As mentioned, I work as technology scout in Bayer with a focus on drug delivery. Before jumping into the content, first the obligatory legal slides. And with that, we can start. So new modalities is a group of molecules with a new mode of action. It depends a bit on how you look of, uh, at them. There's, there's different definitions. Here's an overview by, by Amgen of new modalities from uh, antibody drug conjugate to CAR T cells, but also a class of small molecules. In our group in Bayer, we focus mainly on the non-biological new modalities or the chemically synthesized new modalities. So mainly peptides, somewhat on, on oligonucleotides, but also small molecules like protex. In a recent publication, there was an overview of the challenges around these chemical new modalities. If you see here on the left side in this column, there are, there are different categories. So beyond root of five molecules like protex, uh, peptides, which will be the focus of my talk, but also oligonucleotides. And what they have in common, that they all have challenges with GI tract permeability, which is translate in um, oral drug delivery. So usually they have to be formulated as an injection. However, recently some new technologies came to life and also some new marketed products allowing these molecules and especially peptides to be delivered orally. Just briefly summarizing the challenges around oral peptide delivery. In order to get peptides systemically available, there are certain barriers that need to be overcome. For example, there's the stomach with a very low pH and enzymes available, uh, enzymes present leading to degradation of peptides. Even if we overcome these barriers and make it to the intestines, there are different barriers like a thick mucus layer or a tight cellular barrier, which makes it difficult for these molecules to be orally available. 
However, there's certain technologies came to life in the recent years. Summarized here, for example, we can add mu mucus penetrators. Um, we can formulate them as mucus adhesive patches, improving the residence time in intestinal tract, leading to larger bi oral bioavailability. We can inhibit, inhibit enzymes in order to prevent degradation in the stomach. And there's a new class of molecules uh, called permeation enhancers, which improve paracellular and transcellular transport. And finally, there's also a new group of microneedles, where you basically swallow a, a microneedle that, that, that locally injects into the intestinal wall, leading to systemic exposure of large molecules. In the next slide, I will go through some of these molecules and, and summarize their, their, their advantages. First, there's the, the products that, that came, to, uh, came to the market, Rebelsis last year, from a collaboration of Novo Nordisk and Emisphere, which is basically a formulation of semaglutide with a permeation enhancer called SNAC. The permeation enhancer allows semaglutide to be orally, uh, orally absorbed and therefore systemically available. It's not a breakthrough technology, I would say. It improves the oral, bio oral bioavailability to one to two percent. However, this, since semaglutide have such a long circulating half-life, it allows for it to be orally available. So as mentioned, maybe not a breakthrough technology, but it is showing that some peptides can be formulated with permeation enhancers, improving or leading to oral bioavailability. Another product that's recently FDA approved from Chiasma with their transient permeation and, and enhancer, the product called MyCapsa, which is a formulation of a peptide octreotide with a permeation enhancer uh, formulated as a particle into an oily suspension formulated into a capsule. And after ingestion, the capsule opens, releasing the oily suspension, releasing the, the octreotide and the permeation enhancer, similar like snack, improving oral bioavailability. So again, another example where we see that pep certain peptides can be formulated with a permeation enhancer, making it into a market, market, marketable product. A new class, as mentioned before, microneedles. Um, what, there was this technology that started, I think it was about five years ago from Rani Therapeutics, a Rani pill. We see it here on the left side. It's a, it's a maybe relatively complex technology. We have a capsule with on either either end of the capsule a chemical compartment that, upon dissolving of the capsule, interact with each other, creating a gas CO2 in this case, which in the next step inflates a balloon that is coated with API, um, uh, which sugar needles made out of needles made out of sugar and API piercing the intestinal wall and from there on releasing the drug. And also there, uh, in last year, Rani completed the first tri first trial, also using octreotide. So again, a product that that, that seems to work and and being, is being further developed. With this was one of the first ones to who came to life. A uh, few followed. Here is one other example from uh, Soma from the group of MIT on the collaboration with Novo Nordisk. It's based on this tertoise that is always facing with its belly down. Basically, have a very low center of mass. So upon ingestion, the, the, the device is pointed towards the, the stomach lining and from there injecting. So we see here on the right is the spring-loaded device that then shoots out this, this needle made out of API and sugar. What we see here on the right is a comparison of a subcutaneous insulin injection compared to the SOMA device. So what we see here on the y-axis is the blood, blood glucose change. And we see here that this device has a similar leads to a similar change of blood glucose compared to the subcutaneous injection. We also see that in other cases, this is another technology in, in um, using ionic liquids, where insulin is formulated into an ionic liquid and compared to a subcutaneous injection. I must say here that the oral insulin given here is five times as high as the subcutaneous uh, injection, so there's definitely a difference in bioavailability. But again, we see that complex molecules like insulin can be formulated in a way that leads to cl close change in, in, in a PIC model here. We'll see some PK data on the right side where we see that if we get insulin alone in a saline solution, there's no uh, visible um, amount of insulin available in, 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 in the blood. However, we do see in this ionic liquid that we get comparable levels compared to subcutaneous injection. So again, showing that complex molecules like insulin and peptides can be orally bioavailable. 
One final example that I want to show here, um, maybe linking nicely to the talk of uh, Peter in the previous talk, uh, showing liposomes from the University of Heidelberg or the company Heidelberg, which uses liposomes, formulation of liposomes with a peptide. Inside, that, inside the formulation are, are other compounds, um, increasing the pH of the stomach or preventing the liposome from degradation in the stomach. And finally, the liposome should help in getting the the peptide over the intestinal barrier. We see here on the right side two examples. This example using octreotide with uh, different formulations of a liposome, and we see that in, indeed the the, um, the oral bioavailability of octreotide is enhanced. Here we see another one on the right side with an, another com complicated large molecule, vancomycin, and we see that with this technology we get systemic exposure. So to summarize, we see new modalities and especially synthetic new modalities that come with certain challenges of oral bio, being oral bioavailability and usually have to be formulated into ejection, which is of course not a patient friendly system. And what we see in the past year is that there's more and more technologies coming to life dealing with these challenges, allowing some of these molecules to be orally bioavailable. Some of them made it to the market, some of them are far, still far away from that, but the trend is that we see more of these technologies that might in five to 10 years from now potentially allow oral bioavailability of these larger molecules. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, mute and... Um, I'm having some difficulties, Berend. I cannot hear you. Yeah, I muted myself. Uh, so uh, please submit your questions into the uh, question module. So far, nothing arrived. Um, uh, maybe one question from my side, Wouter, um, since we are waiting for other questions. Um, so what do you see is the challenge? Is it the ability to come up with um, new uh, formulations or is it more the ability to know what the real problem is or what, what let's say, what aspects that are in the way of efficacy can be tested early in order to better define what may work? Um. I'm not sure if I got your question correctly. At least what I see is one of the challenges that we try to get any type of molecule into an oral product, where sometimes the structure itself is not available for oral bioavailability. We deal with certain peptides that have such a short circulating half-life that even if you're able to formulate them into an oral, uh, oral, tech, oral formulation, they are so quickly degraded and with with um, large changes in um, uh, or patient pa patient to patient differences, you will not be able to get a stable concentration in the blood. So I think we should also optimize our peptides to uh, long circulating half-life peptides in order to be able to apply certain technologies as, as we've seen with semaglutide for example. Yeah, very good. So, any more questions? Um, I'm not receiving any. Um, Joshua, is the technology working? Okay. So if there are not more questions, I think we can bring forward the next talk. So I'm happy to have Mark Chiu, Associate Director, Process Analytical Support of Large Molecule Analytical Development at Janssen Research and Development in Raritan, New Jersey, uh, to talk about manufacturing considerations for bispecific and multispecific antibodies. Thank you, Bert, uh, for this invitation to present to you all with regards to manufacturing considerations for bispecific antibodies. What I intend to do today is highlight, um, oops, excuse me. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, what I intend to do is to highlight an application 
of a bispecific antibody in terms of its particular design and some of the CMC considerations that are worthwhile for making large batches of this kind of a molecule. So the therapeutic hypothesis lies that most cancers have EGFR signaling. A lot of the single agent targeting is effective for a short while until you have rapid development of resistance. One of the major pathways linked towards EGFR resistance is the upregulation of the CMET receptor. This particular gene increase associated ligands involvement results in that resistance mechanisms often coming rather quickly. So the hypothesis was that if we can make a bispecific antibody so that you can shut down both receptors, you would have a more effective therapeutic. Mark, could you please turn up the camera a little? Your face is cut off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> or lean back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bert. <laughs> okay, so uh, <clears throat> there's some interesting challenges with targeting the CMET receptor. If you have an antibody that comes through, it will induce receptor aggregation, resulting in phosphorylation, resulting in the opposite effect that you want in terms of tumor control. So what you have to do then is make a bispecific antibody that is monovalent for engagement with the CMET receptor, monovalent with regards to EGFR receptor. This allows you to have that specificity, dual targeting to shut down the possibility of growth. So you use a technology in which we take two different antibodies each antibody has a particular point mutation in a CH3 domain, allowing for a control fab arm exchange, you're able to generate the bispecific species. Now, um, there's a lot of details in terms of the selection, a molecule that has different mechanisms of action that allows for engagement for the patient's immune system to have a better kind of a response. And this is something that we are moving rapidly into BLA status at the end of this year. But coming back to this theme, in this theme of anticipating what are some of the CMC issues, this is a bispecific technology. We use the standard platform methods to generate an antibody. We mix the two antibodies together. We go through a reduction process to allow for the engagement and generation that that bispecific, and then you have to remove the reducing agent, allow for oxidation to have the complete more stable bispecific molecule being made. So with this particular process in mind, there are our tools you have to put together. The first tool is being able to distinguish the product from the initial reactants. And this we use hydrophobic interaction chromatography to rapidly assess this particular amount. The next is we want to rapidly assess the purity of the system. This will include a capillary-based SDS electrophoresis system, where in the reduced, you can see the individual components of the light chains and the heavy chains. And for the non-reduced, of course, you look at the integrity of the species versus other kinds of components. We can also do experiments looking at the aggregation state that involves the application of size seclusion and static light scattering that allows us to ascertain the integrity of the aggregated species over a period of time. Here, the data just more or less showing that you have a monodispersed system that we have to work with. So in having these tools, the next step is to try to optimize the parameters associated with the reduction process, because this is something that is not typical for standard antibody, monoclonal antibody preparations. And you can probe questions about the ideal situation, pH, the amounts of a reducing agent, the time points, the temperatures. And essentially when you put this all together, you can define a contour plot, identifying the regime from which the reducing agent is stable, the regime associated with the reduction time, the concentration and maximum yield of that bispecific antibody. Now, since we do have a reducing agent, it is critical to assess the integrity of the drug substance. The drug substance has a variety of 
disulfide bonds and making sure that you have the correct orientation of the disulfides is one of the next responsibilities within the effort. So one has to look at free thiols. There's a fluorescent dye labeling system. The more or less show that the bispecific antibody can meet the same criteria of free thiol content, okay, which is not pretty much negligible after the oxidation process. The next question that comes into mind is, do you have any possibility of swapping of the domains associated with disulfide mismatching that takes place? So if you have any of the orange protein components mixing with the blue protein components, you can use a quick way to more or less ascertain whether any of these uninvertent um, species do arise. Um, we could do this very quickly by using variations of LCMS, being able to identify the individual components, the particular sizes associated separation of the individual components allows us to more or less ascertain that we have the correct species. You can also take the time to look at the respective masses of the different domains. The different domains, if they had swaps, would have measured masses that would not correspond correctly. And being able to do this in a very rapid fashion is a way, a rapid way of more or less ascertaining what the best conditions would be to run this kind of a process. We did have to take a lot of time to more or less map out the rate kinetics associated with the formation of the bispecific species. This is done with a variety of single molecule and fluorescence methods to more or less map out the entire process. The value of having rate kinetics is that when you have online monitoring of the individual components, you can more or less tailor the reaction time so that you can get the net product you want in the individual steps for the generation of the bispecific antibody. So as a reminder in terms of working with API generated recombinant monoclonal antibodies for this particular bispecific system, you have two cell lines, you go through a bioreactor generation because this is a mammalian system generation, you do have to worry about viral inactivation, large scale preparation, makes it easier for us just to use a pH shift and hold to more or less eliminate that possibility for the regulatory agencies. And then you go through the reduction and downstream purification. Now with this bispecific antibody, because you do introduce new stages of the antibody process, particularly with regards to the reduction oxidation, you do have to change things. This additional change in the process means that you have to understand the relative stability of the system. And one of the things that we have noticed was that you do have to do some modifications. That process of having that low pH viral inactivation stage is a rather uh, process that can perturb the relative integrity of the proteins. So you can do things like generate the individual supernatants conduct the reduction so you can make a much more stable protein system. And then you now further do perform the viral inactivation stage where you have a much more stable drug substance molecule. And then you go through the process of downstream purification. Um, and this probably modification just allows us to modify what we need to have depending on the molecular basis of the bispecific species we wanna work with. So, this bispecific technology, there's a lot more that you have to do in terms of the characterization of the individual components. Of course, this makes it more interesting for us in development, the additional aspects of the characterization more or less, more or less ascertains that we can generate a stable uh, process by which we can generate this bispecific antibody. One of the things, of course, we're very excited about this molecule is that if you look in this profile from the phase two, phase three trials, a lot more people are responding well to EGFR mutated forms of lung cancer. And hopefully we'll be able to provide this for patients in a very short while, okay? So with that, I thank you for your attention and thank you, Bernd, for this opportunity to share this information. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for this very interesting talk. Um, the floor is open for questions. I'm switching on again 
this um, window for questions. Uh, please submit in the, uh, here. And there's a question um, from Michael Keller uh, on milk exosomes. What do you make of recent reports regarding bovine milk exosomes to mediate oral bioavailability? Is this a concept that has a future for drug uh, delivery? Um, I think that sounds like a great idea. Uh, there's a big question about um, the oral delivery uh, mechanism, making sure that the drug substance is not perturbed. Um, so that's the only thing that you have to more or less work with. Um, something that uh, is a great idea has an opportunity to pursue because um, <clears throat> there is not much known about oral delivery of antibody. We heard some excellent presentations from Wouter about the uh, oral delivery of peptides. I would love to participate perhaps in a collaboration to see whether we can extend that to larger proteins. Okay. More questions? So I check the chat window we have here. No, there's nothing. Okay, um, there are no more questions. So thank you very much, Mark, for this nice presentation. And now we can switch over to, again, a different new modality. It's about gene therapy manufacturer um, by Magdalena obadzanek voigt a principal scientist at Pharmaceutical Development Novartis in Basel. Oh, Magdalena, the stage is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, oh, just give me a second. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so uh, my name is Magdalena Bajanek Foyt. I'm a drug product leader in uh, cell engine uh, therapy uh, within uh, technical research development at Novartis. And now uh, we are located under uh, global drug development. Um, today in this talk, I will uh, 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 talk to you about uh, gene therapy manufacturing with a special focus on the lentiviral vector. Uh, before we go into the uh, uh, presentation itself, I want to share with you this disclaimer that uh, uh, in case you uh, want to use any information provided in this talk, please uh, uh, um, contact me up front. And of course, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter and uh, do not necessarily refle reflect the official policy or position of Novartis and its offices. My talk today will be composed of uh, four main parts. Uh, first, I will uh, uh, talk uh, briefly about the uh, background and the viral vectors and its use in uh, gene therapies. Um, I want to also mention a, a few points about regulatory classification of lentiviral vector, and then I will go into lentiviral vector manufacturing process and uh, the strategy uh, we undertake on, uh, in development uh, world. Uh, those who has uh, uh, part, who has uh, actually seen my talk yesterday uh, are already familiar with this slide, so I, I don't want to go into uh, uh, details, but I want to uh, briefly highlight uh, where the lentiviral vectors are located. Uh, so, uh, briefly, in cell engine therapy, we have two types of therapies, ex vivo and in vivo. Uh, in the ex vivo, we take the cells from the patient cells and modify them uh, in, uh, in vitro uh, uh, by using uh, different mode of deliveries uh, of gene uh, uh, of interest. Uh, lentiviral vectors are one of the mode of delivery, and uh, we uh, use uh, lentiviral vectors in uh, our commercialized product called Kimraya, uh, which is a CAR T cell therapy uh, uh, treatment. Of course, uh, historically looking uh, at uh, uh, viral vectors used in gene therapy, uh, uh, we, we have to acknowledge uh, retroviral vectors uh, in, uh, in addition to lentiviral vectors. Uh, so retroviral vectors, uh, gamma retroviral vectors were first used in uh, cell therapies, and they were pretty frequently used in already in the uh, 1990s. Uh, however, due to their uh, uh, incorporation near the start codon uh, and uh, potential uh, activation of onco uh, uh, 
uh, oncogenes, uh, they were less uh, successful than lentiviral vectors. Uh, another point is that lentiviral vectors uh, has a possibility also to transduce not only in, in, uh, dividing cells, but also non-dividing cells, which makes them actually ideal uh, for gene therapy uh, of uh, highly differentiated and post-metatic cells. Uh, lentiviral vector structure, actually, they are uh, spherical uh, particles of a size of approximately 80 to 100 nanometers. Uh, the viral vector genome is a diploid positive sense single strand uh, RNA uh, that is complex with the nucleocapsid protein and bound uh, to the reverse transcriptase integrase and uh, protease. Nucleocapsid is uh, enclosed in the, in the protein shell and formed by, by the um, capsid uh, protein. This uh, internal core is, um, is uh, surrounded by matrix protein that interact with the lipid envelope uh, protein. Lipid membrane contains the uh, uh, envelope glycoprotein, which are crucial in the uh, binding to the cell membrane because they are composed of the transmembrane and uh, surface membrane, uh, so transmembrane domain and surface domain. Surface domain is uh, specifically interacting with receptor, in, uh, receptor um, on the cell surface and mediate uh, viral vector entry inside the cell. As I briefly mentioned, Kim Rai is using lentiviral vector, and I want to show you here a, a high-level description of the uh, Kim Rai process. So, uh, Kim Rai is an autologous cell therapy uh, that starts at the moment uh, at the, the clinical site with the collection of leukapheresis, which is cryopreserved and shipped uh, to the manufacturing site. In the manufacturing site, um, CD3 and CD28 uh, beads uh, are used for uh, uh, T cell enrichment and activation. In the next Next steps, uh, the uh, T cells uh, are transduced using lentiviral vector, expanded, and then formulated uh, um, uh, uh, and cryopreserved, uh, such as they can be uh, shipped back to the uh, clinical center and infused into the patient. Of course, this process of the manufacturing uh, has to uh, be very uh, well uh, um, um, controlled uh, uh, from the perspective of lentiviral vector availability. So um, with lentiviral vectors, it was never uh, that simple to uh, understand how we should uh, uh, produce them. So uh, uh, as you may know, uh, there are um, different regulations, uh, slightly different, slightly uh, slight differences between EU and uh, uh, US regulations. In the EU, uh, EU uh, we have uh, four main um, uh, materials that enter um, uh, drug manufacturing, uh, starting material, raw materials, active drug substance, and drug product. Uh, so, uh, what lentiviral vector will be classified? Uh, we, uh, if you look a little bit more into details on the description of each of these uh, uh, different uh, uh, material um, in the process of manufacturing of the drug product, uh, we can see that uh, starting material uh, is a substance of a defined chemical properties and structure that is incorporated as a significant structural fragment into the structure of the drug substance. So this will classify uh, uh, pos uh, very similarly that uh, lentiviral vector can go into here. Um, I want to also mention to you active drug substance, which are composed of the manipulated or non-manipulated cells prior to filling into final container for administration. So that might be a little bit confusing, but in fact, uh, um, uh, EU uh, classifies uh, lentiviral vector as the starting material. Slight different nomenclature is used in the US uh, um, uh, by US health authorities. And uh, uh, in addition to drug substance and drug product, uh, we have also ancillary material and cr critical components. Critical components have a significant impact on the quality of the final product, even though it's not incorporated into the structure of the drug product. So you may already guess uh, that uh, viral, lentiviral vector are classified as the critical component by uh, US. Due to the fact that we have a starting material and critical component, which has to have a, a, a quality similar to the drug uh, a substance, um, the process of the manufacturing of lentiviral vector has to go uh, uh, under uh, controlled uh, GMP conditions. 
Let me go uh, tell you a couple of uh, uh, minutes about manufacturing process. Um, the manufacturing process of lentiviral vector starts uh, with uh, working cell bank or master cell bank uh, thawing uh, and goes through cell expansion um, and then uh, pDNA co-transfection. Uh, in order to assure that lentiviral vector product is uh, safe, uh, we use currently for uh, four plasmids for uh, co-transfection, uh, each carrying different um, uh, different um, uh, part of the vector. We have one plasmid uh, that encodes a uh, transgene. We have also plasmid plasmid that encodes a uh, ref, uh, envelope uh, protein and transcription, uh, uh, so regulatory element and transcription uh, elements. Uh, all this process um, uh, requires uh, um, requires certain time, and uh, uh, within uh, somehow like 15 days, uh, uh, we start the uh, uh, downstream process, uh, which starts with the vector harvest uh, and uh, goes through the vector purification and up concentration. Um, in the last uh, stage uh, of the manufacturing, lentiviral vector product uh, is uh, formulated, uh, filled into suit suitable packaging and uh, uh, frozen uh, to be stored and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, is pro progressed with the release testing strategy. Of course, when the lentiviral vector is uh, available, can only enter um, a process of uh, gene therapy manufacturing. Uh, regarding the um, uh, process manufacturing, we uh, have different approaches uh, that uh, we can um, uh, concentrate on increasing the vector stability during the process and increasing the yield. Uh, each of the process uh, manufacturing process step has critical impact on those parameters. Uh, so uh, if we look uh, already on the USP uh, parts, uh, cell culture um, uh, and expansion, selection of the type of culture, uh, selection of the cell line, um, uh, definition of the method of passaging uh, and stability of the product, as well as uh, cell growth kinetics, has significant impact on the vector yield. In the right hand of the slide, I'm showing you a, a, an example of different seeding uh, concentration and their impact on the lentiviral uh, vector title. So you see that uh, optimization of this uh, process step uh, can have a significant impact uh, uh, on the increase of uh, the uh, final vector yield. Another part of the USB process is the optimization of uh, co-transfection, uh, uh, plasmid co-transfection. Uh, so uh, in the co-transfection process, we use the uh, transfection agent. So the selection of the uh, um, productive transfection agent is very critical, but we also focus on uh, uh, optimization of plasmid ratio and definition of the DNA quality. And uh, the last step of the USP is a uh, lentiviral uh, production phase in which uh, we uh, can um, uh, select the feeding strategy for the cells, uh, as well as day of harvest. Uh, and this process is pretty difficult to scale up. Uh, in the right hand, I, I show you an example of, uh, um, uh, of a study uh, defining cell seeding concentration and harvest time point on the uh, vector titer. So as you can see, we have selected different seeding density and as well different uh, harvest time point, and uh, uh, this helped us to define the, the, the most uh, uh, suitable time point for lentiviral vector harvest to uh, uh, optimize and increase uh, the vector, uh, vector, uh, vector yield in the process. So the um, uh, upstream process is uh, basically focusing on finding uh, um, the best uh, scenario on uh, uh, and optimizing the, the manufacturing uh, uh, early process. Uh, we can uh, uh, distinguish uh, expansion phase amplification phase and production phase. Uh, so in the expansion phase, uh, we look for the seed train. So to find the most uh, suitable uh, vector seeding density and to find the optimal moment for the, uh, for the uh, uh, um, uh, changing into the new vessel. In the amplification phase, we uh, want to find the, uh, the best moment on the uh, vector transfection and as well as the uh, uh, best time of uh, harvest of lentiviral vector product. 
Uh, further, uh, drug, the downstream process uh, uh, development uh, is focusing on four main pillars. Uh, um, we, we look on the uh, optimization of vector recovery, uh, increasing the final titer, uh, but as well having the universal process uh, that can uh, uh, be uh, applicable for different vector types, uh, different vectors uh, carrying the different uh, uh, transgene. Of course, the main challenge uh, of uh, the downstream process is uh, scalability. So in, the, uh, in, the, in respect of the recovery, we know that vector is, lentiviral vectors are very uh, sensitive to shear uh, stresses and chemicals, as well as the uh, manufacturing duration. Uh, regarding the final titer, uh, uh, we uh, of course uh, aim at uh, uh, having the highest yield uh, of the vector manufacturing, but we need to also uh, remember that our vector is entering another process, uh, uh, cell process. Uh, so optimization of the concentration might be be very uh, project specific um, and therefore uh, we need to also look whether this uh, uh, title that is required uh, can um, uh, facilitate the downstream processing as well such as for instance ster sterile filtration. And of course, uh, the universal, so kind of a template uh, manufacturing process that can be uh, slightly modified depending on the transgene uh, um, that is carried by lentiviral vector um, is, uh, is a biggest challenge in the downstream process development. Uh, to scale uh, uh, scale up, we often use the single use equ equipment, and of course, the process of the uh, manufacturing uh, has to be closed. Uh, in, uh, has to be performed in a closed system. Uh, here, I want to show you an example of uh, uh, optimization of downstream processing uh, with the focus on different process steps. Of course, in the uh, uh, we have uh, uh, different uh, steps of the downstream, like uh, cell removal, filtration, ultrafiltration, DIA filtration, chromatography, uh, second UFDF, and sterile filtration. Uh, with non-optimized process, you can see here on the left-hand side um, that the vector recovery is pretty uh, uh, weak, and at the end of the uh, manufacturing we can yield only 5 to 15 percent vector recovery. However, with the optimization of each of the particular step of the downstream processing, we were able to increase the vector recovery on, uh, on each of the steps, uh, leading to the final uh, uh, increase in the vector yield uh, of approximately 30 to 40 percent. Uh, another step uh, for the uh, manufacturing process is also definition of uh, um, a fill and finish, as well as a formulation that supports the uh, vector stability and prevents a, a vector to, to be uh, disturbed by shear uh, stresses that are um, uh, applied during manufacturing process. Um, also, a very important aspect is definition of uh, uh, the uh, primary packaging. So uh, we are not talking here about drug delivery because the vector is a, a, is a critical component for entering into cell manufacturing process. But we need to always remember as well that uh, this vector has to uh, be suitable to the uh, current uh, process, uh, cell process uh, that is uh, developed. Uh, so definition of the container uh, may have a, a really significant impact on the overall uh, cell therapy uh, product the manufacturing. One more minute. Thank you. I'm almost uh, at the end of my presentation. So, um, in the summary, I have uh, shown you today that uh, we have a slightly different classification of lentiviral vector of gene therapies uh, um, between European Union and uh, the US. Uh, however, in both cases, uh, uh, the regulation are clear. Uh, we have to uh, produce lentiviral vector in a controlled GMP uh, 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 conditions. Um, we have also, uh, I have shown you, shown you uh, different focuses on the uh, uh, development approaches in lentiviral vectors such as increased uh, uh, cell line productivity, uh, lentiviral vector recovery, and increased uh, lentiviral vector stability. However, uh, we have still certain challenges, development challenges, such as uh, uh, we uh, are aiming for representative small scale models that can be easily scaled up. Uh, and uh, um, we are very much dependent on independent, innovative technology uh, access. So with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and thank uh, uh, to, to the team I'm working with uh, um, uh, and uh, who also helped me to compile uh, some of the slides. 
Thank you very much, Magdalena, for the very interesting talk. Um, um, I have a first question from Mark to you. Is there a direct correlation between LVV stability and LVV infectivity? And that might, of course, that is uh, uh, impacting. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, if we have a stable vector, uh, then the infectivity, uh, uh, so transduction efficiency, uh, uh, might be uh, also greater. But uh, this is very much dependent on the transgene, uh, on the vector, on the impurity. So there are many different uh, aspects also contributing to the vector of transduction efficiency. Okay, so submit more questions on the question window. Oops, this is... Sorry, I'm kicked out of this window here. I cannot read the question window. Um, I'm kicked out of it. Um, uh, the, there's another question. Does DNA quality affect LV generation? Uh, I assume that the question is regarding uh, plasmid DNA in this regard. Okay, uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, so the plasmid uh, production has to be also uh, uh, very much controlled um, and uh, um, of course it has an impact on the transfection, transfection efficiency in this situation. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to move on. Um, thanks thank a lot. And um, the next speaker is Dr. Lloyd Jeffs, Director of Clinical Manufacturing Solutions at Precision Nanosystems in Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada, um, talking about acceleration of development of transformative nanomedicines with next generation microfluidics technology. All right. The stage is yours, Lloyd. Thank you. I uh, hope everyone can hear me now. Yeah, we can do. Very good. Um, thank you very much for, um, for the invite. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm currently located on the west coast of Vancouver, so uh, it's quite early in the morning here, uh, but I wouldn't miss this for the world. Um, let me see. Can everybody see the full screen? Yes. Okay, so today I'll be talking about the accelerating the creation and development of transformative nanomedicines. And this work is being done at Precision Nanosystems. Um, so genetic medicines, as we see it, are the future. Uh, you can target any gene, any way. Uh, there's a lot of new technologies coming online right now. Uh, you can silence genes, you can turn them off with uh, short interfering RNA and other non-coding RNAs. You can express genes with messenger RNA with self-amplifying RNA and with DNA vectors. And you can also edit genes as well. So it's a very powerful toolbox and this toolbox is growing uh, with time. So uh, every, every month there's a new advancement. So it's, it really is the future. Uh, genetic medicines, not only do you need to have a nucleic acid, in most cases you need a delivery system. Uh, so, um, RNAs, like messenger RNA and DNAs, are large molecules, uh, and they need a way to get into cells uh, to do their job, to their expression. Uh, so you see here a, a lipid nanoparticle on the left. Um, these sizes can be modulated between 10 and up to a micron in diameter. Uh, for systemic application or parental use, typically those particles are around 100 nanometers in diameter. And you can see they can be either made up of lipids or they can be uh, contain they can be polymeric. Uh, they can also have a combination of lipid and polymers. And they can be administered many ways, uh, parenterally, through intravenously, intramuscularly, or subcutaneously, through the nasal, uh, nasal root, oral, transdermal, or even topical. So developing genetic medicines is challenging. Uh, I think many people realize this. Uh, and one of the first challenges is, is that the nucleic acids, the API, are not very stable and do not readily enter cells on their own. So they need delivery. Uh, there's also a knowledge gap. So genetic medicines are emerging very quickly. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, there's basically 
growing an explosion of interest in this field over the last few years. Uh, but again, it doesn't have a long history like other, other therapeutics or other modalities. Um, working backwards, um, drug, product manuf uh, drug product manufacturing uh, is the ultimate, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm from a manufacturing background. Uh, but you have to get there from scale-up, uh, process development, and these are complex drugs, and they're traditionally difficult to develop and challenging to scale-up. Uh, and lastly, you have to identify that genetic medicines can be applied to many different areas, uh, everything from personalized medicines uh, to mass administration, such as vaccines. Uh, so you have to understand what you're doing, the scales you need to manufacture at, uh, and the intricacies and specificities of each of the, um, the uh, basically the payloads that you're using, whether it's an RNA, uh, short interfering RNA, a messenger RNA, or, or a DNA. So at PNI, we've been developing basically a, a kind of a full solution uh, for uh, nanomedicine development. Uh, that includes our proprietary platform uh, for microfluidic platform for manufacturing uh, nanomedicines. Uh, and the expertise we've developed, uh, this is our 10 year anniversary. Uh, so we started in November, 2010. So we'll be celebrating that in a couple of weeks time, our 10 year anniversary. Uh, and that includes things like discovery. Um, we've done some work, some partnership work. We've worked with clients. Uh, so we've developed a lot of expertise over that time. And also we've developed some uh, proprietary reagents and uh, lipid nanoparticle formulations as well. So for developing gene medicines, there's three components. One is drug discovery, uh, clinical development, and obviously uh, coming up ultimately with an approved drug. So for drug discovery, uh, speed is important to rapidly screen and develop drug candidates. Uh, for clinical development is taking the process that you've developed on the bench, your manufacturing process for your nanomedicines, and scaling that up and performing a successful tech transfer to a CMO. Um, and then obviously entering the clinic and uh, moving through the clinical stages to the point where you're ready to um, basically make an application for a drug approval and then commercialization. So um, many of the clients, I think over, we have um, many, many people that use this technology, uh, many of our clients and customers uh, they fall into the therapeutic um, categories, infectious diseases and vaccines, uh, rare diseases, oncology and personalized medicine are all, um, are all areas where nanomedicines can make a big impact. And I think our vision for the future is, is that medicines will be tailored uh, to, specific, to the specific molecular basis of an individual's disease, uh, develop much faster than currently, and manufactured locally. So removing things like having to ship um, drug products and finished drug products around the world to have it manufactured in the same city or the same site where patients are treated. So that's our vision for the future. Uh, the core to what Precision Nanosystems does and our technology is uh, the microfluidics. And we have this next-gen microfluidics technology now, which is non-turbulent particle formation. We can precisely control how the particles self-assemble. We can do that in a very reproducible way. Uh, and we, get, uh, we can manufacture a wide range of nanoparticle types, liposomes, lipid nanoparticles, polymeric na nanoparticles, uh, peptide nanoparticles. Our technology is very scalable uh, using a single mixer uh, while maintaining the same particle quality and batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility. And I'll show some data to support that. And we're constantly innovating this technology. Uh, so for nucleic acids, it's quite applicable because it's a very gentle technology. Um, we can mass produce these microfluidic mixes. We can basically, any research lab can use this technology to develop their own therapeutic agents. And compared to earlier technologies, uh, like the high energy techniques, like extrusion and sonication, um, which is a top down manufacturing process, um, and in quite, in the sometimes quite harsh conditions, those are not so amenable to nucleic acid um, nanomedicine production and development. So as mentioned, we can generate nanoparticles. These are lipid nanoparticles. 
uh, with a messenger RNA payload in the top uh, left-hand side. Uh, very reproducible physical chemical properties, uh, consistent particle size, consistent encapsulation efficiency of the payload. Uh, and we're seeing morphology as well, a homogeneous morphology. Uh, and that scales as we go from, say, with the, um, the systems that we operate on the bench uh, to the process development instruments and then to the GMP instruments. Uh, we also take advantage of something called limit size, which is the thermodynamically favorable size for a particle. And we can maintain that as we scale up, as we use these larger microfluidic mixers we can actually maintain the ideal particle size by controlling the self-assembly process. So also, um, apart from particle formation, uh, you have to make a drug product. So we've understood and have an understanding of how to basically uh, integrate uh, this technology with downstream processing, uh, such as tangential flow filtration and sterile filtration, ensuring that the particle that you make uh, on at formation is actually has the same properties in the final drug product. And whether that drug product stored at two to eight or even under frozen conditions, we want to ensure that these physical chemical properties are maintained and you have a stable active formulation. So um, this is a case study we did where we used our own uh, proprietary reagent, which is available commercially, uh, Genvoy ILM, using commercially available um, uh, EPO mRNA from Trilink, and we formulated at different scales uh, on our bench scale instrument, the Ignite, on the Blaze instrument, and on our GMP system using the same next-gen microfluidics uh, from basically small volumes of 4 milliliters up to 325 milliliters. The GMP system can actually can manuf manufacture 50 liters if we so needed to, uh, but again, in this case, the messenger RNA was in short supply and we couldn't make a super large batch. So we basically used the same messenger RNA LMP formulation made on the three systems. We see very consistent um, particle size across the instruments at different scales. We also see that the polydispersity in these black dots here are very consistent, less than 0.1. And encapsulation efficiency is a very consistent across the, uh, across the scales as well, with greater than 90% of the nucleic acid encapsulated. We also, in addition to the biophysical uh, chemical properties of the particles being conserved, we also see, saw here that we have uh, very uh, similar biological activity, uh, EPO expression uh, in the blood. And also we saw, um, in the serum, sorry, and also we saw a hemocrat Commander Creek increase across all scales uh, of the of this mRNA formulation, whether it's made on the bench scale instrument or our GMP system. So very reproducible uh, results, very predictable results as we scale up. Uh, this is our GMP system. Uh, it again uses the same microfluidics technology. Here you can see the mic microfluidic mixer. Um, it's a very configurable system. Uh, it's, it's continuous flow and we can make particles, uh, batches up to greater than 50 liters uh, in about four hours. Uh, and it, we have basically, we can integrate it with downstream processing and we have the full suite of traceability for the fluid path, which is single use and SOPs, uh, installation operation qualifications for the instrument as well that can be transferred to clients uh, and CMOs. Uh, this is One an example. Minute. Okay, I have to go a little faster. So uh, we have example here of a, a company that we work with, Sononomics, uh, with Dr. David Evans, a testimonial here, where we can actually make a protein nanoparticle, and we did that reproducibly, scaled it up from small scale to large scale, um, and we have established partnerships with these various clinical manufacturers, uh, with Fujifilm, with Berna, Entos, and Daiichi Sankyo, um, and also clinical manufacturing uh, organizations as well. So um, lastly, I want to say, this is some breaking news from last Friday. Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, announced that uh, they have funded us for 18.2 million from the government of Canada to develop an RNA vaccine for COVID-19. 
which is very exciting. It's going to be using self-amplifying RNA uh, to synthetic vaccine. And we have done some initial work with uh, Dr. Robin Shattock and Anna Blackney at Imperial College to show that with the self-amplifying RNA LMP formulation we developed, mediate a potent antibody response in a mouse flu model. And also we've seen a potent antibody response in a COVID-19 mouse immun immunogenicity model. And lastly, uh, we've seen a potent neutralizing antibody response also in this COVID-19 mouse immunogenicity <laughs> model at one microgram going down to nanogram uh, ranges, which is very impressive and very encouraging. This is being currently developed uh, for the Made in Canada uh, uh, vaccine that we're developing right now. Um, again, we're a global company headquarters in Vancouver with North, uh, presences in North America, uh, in Europe and also in Asia. So uh, thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Um, so we are taking questions on the questions panel. Uh, let me see whether there's already something. No. Any question in the chat? No. Um, maybe a question from my side. So um, are you, um, let's say, already with your technology in marketed products? No, we do not actually. So we have our technologies be used to make phase one uh, material for clinical trials, but we do not have any marketed products using the microfluidic technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So then we um, go on. So the next speaker will be Karen Abitorabi. Uh, from Novartis, a senior fellow in cell and gene therapy in Basel, uh, talking about the development of a cell therapy with gene-modified primary cells. Karin, the stage is yours. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I will take you now to a totally different world. Um, this is the world of the cells. And what I would like to share with you is a little bit my little world where I live in, a process, in developing processes for primary cells. And of course, we do also do gene modifications of those cells. And I will talk to you a little bit about the challenges and how we go about the um, development. So first, um, just to pick everybody up on the same page, I will give you a little bit of background and then I will show you how we develop a cell therapy. So the first thing we have to think about when we start with cell therapy development is, do I have an autologous product or do I have an allogeneic product? Depending on which one it is, we have to deal with different, our processes have to deal with different kinds of challenges. One of them is the volume for an autologous of the cells that we can work with. And the other one is the disease status of the cells. And I'll get into this a little bit later. The problem with the allogeneic or the challenge with the allogeneic is that basically you could have graft versus host disease because you, you have to work with the donor compatibility and you have to make sure the HLA matches. So, and then when it comes to definitions, there's for example, pure cell therapies, which can be either autologous or allogeneic. And mainly this is um, stem cell transplants coming from bone marrow or cord blood. You've all heard about those when it comes to chemotherapy. The next one is what we, what Magdalena talked a lot about today was a gene therapy, for example, where we can work also And yesterday, actually, she talked about that too, um, where we have adenovirus therapies, AAVs or messenger RNAs, where we do directly insert a gene into a place uh, in the body to repair the defect of a diseased area. And then we have the combo. And one of the combos that you all have heard about from Novartis is the Kimraya, where Magdalena alluded to how they produce the lentivirus. And I will show you a little bit how we can deal in making the cell process work. So a cell and gene therapy can be either an autologous or an allogeneic cell transplant after gene modification of the cells. We can do this with viruses. We can do this with CRISPR-Cas9. And now that I've heard a lot about these nanobodies and the work that you guys are doing um, here and at this conference, showing at this conference, I'm thinking maybe we can even use some of your um, 
ter I mean, some of your um, tools to actually get uh, the genes of interest into the cells. So how do we develop it? So the first thing we have to do is um, we have to, um, we are getting as first step from research and an idea. And they say to us, they say, listen, I have this cells, I'd like to do this, and I'd like to cure this kind of disease. So what is happening is we have to first scale up most often from culture plates and flask into a larger volume um, of culture, then because we have to produce for each patient up to billions of cells. That's the first part, it's a scale up. Then we have to make sure that we introduce closed systems for, for these research processes to reduce the contamination risk by using tubing sets um, and automation and welding and sealing. Of course, automation is always a big goal because we want to control the process as much as possible and reduce the human factor, which is here contributing to not being consistent. And then the next thing we have to think about is we need to consider the footprint of our equipment and the design of the GMP clean room. So the more, if we go to a CMO or if we do it internally, we have to think about how many GMP clean rooms for each of these cell therapies do I have to create and how big do they have to be? And we need to look at cost and redundancy of equipment. So it's better to actually use an equipment into multiple steps twice or three times during a process than having uh, for each step a different piece of equipment. And last but not least, the most important is that the processing is robust with variable starting material. So what do, how does a normal cell therapy usually look like? So what is going to happen is we get either fresh or cryopreserved starting material from the patients. These will be tested and released for us for processing. Then we isolate the cells of interest. And again, we do a lot of analytical testing, which are now in process controls, where, for example, we look at yields and at purity. Then we expand the cells again and do testing during the expansion to see how they're growing. And then we gene modify the cells. And there we have many, many different options. And again, after the gene modification, you have to look at in-process testing to see how many cells you've recovered and how big your um, gene modification was. Usually after gene modification, we gave the cells a little bit time to rest and to grow so that we have more and merrier and the best ones. And then um, after the, at the end of the process, we can harvest and final formulate. And here the testing is mainly the release testing to get the cell therapy back to the patient. So this is a general overview of a cell therapy. Oh, and I forgot the cryopreservation. Of course, we have to cryopreserve the cells um, in order to ship them across all the different countries, uh, depending on where our manufacturing site is. Developing a cell therapy is not possible if you don't have the three pillars of, a, of the CGT development. And that is basically three different groups that have to work tightly together in order to build this tower. One is the um, analytics, because as you saw in my previous slide, they have to basically tell us that we still have the, the right cells, that they're happy and that they're viable. And then we have process development, who is doing the process um, as de developing the process as, as said before. And then at the end, we have drug product development that help us with final formulation and cryopreservation and also with final packaging. And Magdalena has spoken a lot about that. Now I want to take you back to your old biology class and just to explain again what we work with. We work with the source tissue, which is the immune system. So we have different kind of projects um, at Novartis. One is, as you know, the, the one that works with the T lymphocytes, which is Kimraya. We also have other projects which are working with the um, stem cells, the blood stem cells. As you can imagine, and this is really important to remember, is my cells today in my body have a different composition than they will have tomorrow because tomorrow I might actually have the flu. And so my cell composition of with all these different types of cells that are in the immune system might be very different. Or I've cut myself and now I need a lot of thrombocytes to actually help me heal from this cut. Or the worst part, which I find is the springtime when the eosinophils are raking havoc and giving us a lot of allergies. So the composition of the same donor 
is actually different from day to day, from month to month. And then the other part is that what happens here is that the donors, my cells are different from your cells and from the next person. So we have also this variability between uh, the, the in within the immune system and also between the different donors that we have to develop a process with. If we look, for example, at the stem cell, the, the hematopoietic stem cell, we have multiple different source materials that we can work with. The first one is umbilical cord blood. And if we have ever seen an umbilical cord blood, it's not a very big tissue and there's very little cells. In, but we find out that the, um, these are the most potent CD34 cells. The next one that we have can work with is, for example, bone marrow, but that also requires um, that the patients um, undergo some kind of surgery where they have to actually be sedated and, it's, um, and then the bone marrow gets removed. So that, that's a little bit more invasive than, um, than the cord blood, for example. And then um, about 25 years ago, or maybe 30 by now, people have started mobilizing peripheral blood. What they do is they basically tell the stem cell that is located in the bone marrow to come out and go to the periphery so we can just do a simple apheresis and remove the cells um, through, the, through the blood ways. And for that, we have two different um, Mobilizing agents currently in, in all the transplant um, institutions, which is either GCSF, that's the old way of mobilizing. And now there is a new way of mobilizing, which is called Mosabil. And then the third version, like for example, for T cells is that we don't mess with the stem cells at all, but we get the cells from the peripheral blood. Just to show you again, the CD34 content is the highest in the umbilical cord. So we have a lot, very potent cells, um, a lot for the tissue size, very potent cells. And then the bone marrow is the next best source. And then the last source, but still very valuable is the mobilized peripheral blood. So this is another cell therapy challenge, which is usually we have one patient is one dose or one batch. It's very different to what we are used to um, in at Novartis. And as I already told you, the donor to donor variability gives us also a little bit of a headache when we de develop a cell therapy process. So what do we do when we get the fresher cryopreserved starting material? And this is a very general overview. And um, just to share with you, what are the normal steps we have to do in each of these process steps? So first, of course, we have to thaw the cells and this we can do also automated and then we have to remove the DMSO in, and wash and then to remove the DMSO and wash the cells so that um, the DMSO doesn't harm the cells. Then we of course have to isolate our cells of interest and really depending on the cell therapy and the applic application and the disease we isolate different kind of cells with different kind of methods. Usually before we isolate the cells, we do a washing step and the volume reduction as said to remove the DMSO, but often we have to also do a big step of volume reduction. And then we can isolate our cells of interest and most often done with antibody magnetic bead based technologies or with density centrifugation. The cell expansion, as you all know, happens either in bags, in cultures, in incubators, or in bioreactors, depending again on how many cells we have to generate. And then the gene modification, there are many different ways of modifying the cell, which is the viral transduction, for example, with lentiviruses, the CRISPR-Cas9, and also electroporation. And the, last, the next step is then the cell expansion again, which is also in, in bags, most often in bags, because those are a closed system. We can sterilely weld onto the bags um, and off the bags or, or seal the bags off and it's a, it's a closed system. And then we do harvest and final formulation. For that, again, we have to remove the media in which the cells have grown and rebuffer it to a different kind of uh, medium which contains the cryopreservation agent DMSO. And then we dispense it into cryo bags so that it then can be cryopreserved under controlled freezing conditions in a controlled rate freezer. Often these bags, these cryo bags will be directly connected to the patient through an infusion line and the patient becomes his dose of cells. One more minute. And I'm nearly there. 
Um, as just to remind you again, what is is important in all of this is that we don't forget the analytical testing. We go through our different steps in order to know that we have the right cells, that they're gene modified, that we have enough cells and that the process is totally under control and robust. And I believe this is it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much, Karen, for the very interesting presentation. I'm checking the question box. Um, those questions that came from previous sessions and could not be answered um, will be processed after we finish the last presentation today. Uh, there's one from Mark. Is this all single use or can you reuse components? No, that's, that's, uh, it's all single use. We cannot re reuse any components or we're trying to not reuse any components um, because we could have a contamination of the next patient. So cross-contamination is one of the biggest issues. And uh, we, we usually have closed system kits that we remove for each patient. So this is also part of what makes a cell therapy so costly is these kits for these automated systems are quite costly. And... Um, and this is one of the reasons why why we uh, we have such a high price tag on some of our cell therapies. Yes, you cannot reuse. Mm -mm. Lots of plastic. Uh, if the first processing does not work with the donor, can you try again? Yes, that is a decision that the PI has to make together with um, with of course the manufacturing facility and us. Um, if it's a if it's a disease where the patient can tolerate another let's say mobilization or another uh, removal of the cells of interest, then of course we can do this. But this is a this is a decision that's not made by just one person. It's made by many many QA and clinical involved and everybody else. Um, yes, we have that option. And it also depends on the disease status of the patient. Okay. Oh, one thing I should mention that I forgot to say, it's basically when we develop a process, we do this all with healthy donor material. We never use diseased material because it's ethically not possible. So we use the healthy donor material. And once we get into the clinical trial, I always say all bets are off because then the diseased material comes in and it's a total different ball game. But we hope that we developed a process that was robust enough to actually deal with also the sickles, uh, the diseased people. Hmm. There's one more question. Can you store batches for patient use later? Yes. So we have a big uh, stability ongoing on the cryopreserved products. Um, so those span multiple months and in some cases also multiple years um, in order for us to um, be able to infuse later one again, if, if needed, or if the, it depends also on what kind of a disease we're targeting and also what kind of a, um, dosing regimen we're targeting. So we have um, sometimes multiple bags stored that can be infused uh, over multiple time points. Yeah, last question on this talk uh, from Francisco Vasquez. How much time takes the process of cell therapy? To develop a process of cell therapy? Um, usually one to two years, depending on how complicated it is uh, or how, how much experience is already there. Um, I would say two years is a good time frame. Um, if you have lots of expertise already in-house, you can, you can pull it off in about two years, 18 months, if you really pushed. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Karin. And now we go on. Um, so the next speaker is... Alexander Huber, Global CMC Head Cell and Gene Therapy Development and Manufacturing at Novartis Basel, uh, driving large scale card cell manufacturing in reality. Okay, Alex. Yes. Here. Thanks, Bernd. Um, just starting up my screen. Mm hmm. I think it works, right? You see it? Yes, we do, Alex, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, again, for the nice invitation and introduction to the conference. Um, 
It's uh, also nice that I'm uh, uh, following my colleagues, uh, excellent uh, scientists from Novartis. Um, so they talked about the, um, um, how to put in place such a therapy. And I'm, I'm more the guy that is then taking care of uh, putting that in reality and driving uh, manufacturing at different sites. So I'm uh, in my role at the moment, I'm uh, ramping up our manufacturing site in Japan, in Kobe. And um, uh, it's a very exciting week because uh, in two days, the site will be approved for commercial manufacturing. So um, I'm, I'm very happy about this development. So again, I will be talking about standardization. Uh, it's uh, less scientific and more about the challenges uh, um, we usually face when we are producing uh, a therapy such as Kimraya. And I want to point out that, of course, there are other therapies, uh, CAR, ther CAR T therapies out from different companies. But of course, I just can talk about Kimraya because I have the experience in that field. So um, on the uh, first slide, you can see um, where we started. So this is uh, um, really a milestone in, uh, in oncology. We're um, able to um, um, cure patients uh, with, with cancer. And you see that uh, so two examples from an adult or um, also from, from a child that had uh, leukemia and then was um, afterwards uh, in remission. And this is exactly where uh, then Novartis also started to, to invest in um, large-scale manufacturing to continue these miracles we have um, done with the, our first patients. So um, just briefly um, to give you a perspective uh, where we started and uh, the, the overview about the journey we had at Novartis with uh, this uh, therapy called Kimraya. Um, we really all started in 2012, uh, where we entered a collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. I will certainly not go through all the steps, but um, I think uh, to um, mention is uh, the approval as the first uh, gene therapy against cancer in August 2017. So this was a big, big moment for us when we had the first uh, commercial batches manufactured. And uh, then some years later, or one year later, we had an approval then um, uh, in, in, in Europe. And uh, this continued then um, uh, to be uh, done for all the other countries. So one country after another, we, we received approval. For, for myself, it was very important that we had uh, the Japanese approval in March 2019. And uh, you see here um, in our illustration always, we have uh, Emily Whitehead as our first patient uh, that is now um, even eight year cancer free, which is um, um, yeah, why we are uh, still doing that. So it's, it gives us a, a big purpose in, in the teams to, to, to drive here for uh, more capacity uh, to treat um, as many patients as possible. But of course, uh, as you can imagine on this journey, that's, uh, uh, it's difficult to achieve that because it's the, the first uh, CAR-T on the market. Um, it was really basically um, taken from the uh, lab bench and then transformed into a large scale ma manufacturing, which was a big challenge and still is today because it's, let's say it's the version 1.0 of uh, CAR-T. So just what it is, at the end, uh, like Karin also mentioned, we are uh, using cryopreservation uh, for Ephoresis product and also then for the final product to ship it to the patient. So from vein to vein, um, it is uh, cryopreserved and in between uh, there is the, the cells are um, transfected and then we have um, in the middle you see how it looks like the construct with the antigen antigen binding site, costillamatory uh, domain and signaling domain. And at the end, um, we have also several clinical studies still ongoing, um, but also a, a lot of approvals um, on a global scale. But that's, in a nutshell, that's Kim Raya. What also is uh, very important if you have um, um, large-scale manufacturing, that you have a global footprint. And uh, in the uh, past years, uh, there are more and more uh, manufacturing units available for Kimraya in our network. So 
We started with uh, Morris Plains in the US as our first uh, flagship site. And then uh, we added uh, several other facilities. Um, additional two are owned by Novartis. This is Les Ulis in France and in Stein in Switzerland. And then we have some CMOs like Fraunhofer uh, in Institute in Germany. And uh, in Japan, Kobe, uh, the Foundation of Biomedical Research of Innovation that is uh, um, um, uh, under my team. I also was uh, doing uh, the tech transfer for CBMG in China and cell therapies in Australia will uh, come online as well. And uh, you see here, uh, besides uh, when you just have one facility, it is usually much easier to, to have um, um, manufacturing done because you, you just have uh, one set of rules because of importation and taxes and all that. And if you have uh, several um, manufacturing sites, it becomes more and more difficult, especially when you need to ship material to China, which have much different uh, laws when you, uh, um, uh, for, for, the, for customs. And uh, the same is true then for Japan. So uh, you have a set of raw materials and uh, a global supply chain, but in certain countries, uh, your materials are not allowed to be shipped to, which makes it again uh, uh, quite complicated. So um, besides a very complicated manufacturing process, uh, there are then the differences from the countries that come on, uh, on top. So optimization means then also optimizing um, where to buy materials and where to ship them and how to ship them. So logistics, supply chain uh, for a therapy that you have one patient, one batch is extremely um, challenging. So, and um, I'll just want to briefly in, um, give you a diff the differences from the ther uh, traditional therapies that are manufactured in a quite linear process from a product mass production, commercial pack packaging and delivery to the patients. Uh, manufacturing of CAR-T um, uh, includes much, much more steps and, and much more materials. So again, uh, you have this uh, the cycle here that is much more complex when it comes to um, the supply chain. You have the patients that, uh, that need to be at the right time in the treatment center for the apheresis. We need to make sure that we have a, a slot allocated for the patient in the uh, cell processing unit. We need to have about 100 materials available um, in the right quality. Some of these materials are quite unique as Magdalena pointed out for the, 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 the vector, uh, uh, this is, there are not many uh, facilities on the planet that can really manufacture a large uh, scale uh, lentivectors for us. So again, uh, it's quite a difficult challenge. And at the end, you have to ship it back uh, after a very um, short period of quality assurance that needs to be also in line with the patient that comes back to the, the hospital. So this is, this is really big, a big, big difference from uh, traditional therapies. And I also I always want men to mention that, uh, uh, never forget, this is the patient's material is in the bag. And uh, um, if, you, um, if the bag falls to the ground and is destroyed, then uh, this is almost, uh, it's much more a disaster than you have uh, from the th traditional therapies where you always have uh, backups. In this case, you never have a backup. You might need to uh, remanufacture or uh, recollect patient cells, which is a big difference as well. So, um, and another point, what is uh, also very important, uh, that, the, that you have um, a very rigorous supply chain, uh, chain of identity established. Uh, this is uh, again, uh, in the interest of the safety, uh, patient safety. So we have um, an IT system put in place that allows uh, the complete chain of identity uh, to be under control. So from the apheresis, again, from vein to vein, uh, from cryopreservation to uh, the transport, uh, manufacturing, and back to, to the patient. So this is something um, that also is uh, quite often underestimated. And uh, because for a large scale, uh, you, you need to have that uh, under uh, absolute control. So again, um, the supply chain part with a very good IT system is uh, critical for success. Okay, I'm already uh, at the final slide. Just um, 
again, the challenges for CAR T standardization. CAR T leads, needs a lot of more raw materials than conventional therapy. So I told you about the 100 plus materials in the supply chain. A lot of them are novel uh, technologies. Um, and uh, it's much more complex if you have one uh, of these um, materials that are not being delivered to you to your site and you're running out of something it can be all always uh, uh, very difficult in 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 the global from a global perspective and uh, with the different sites we try then to help out then um, it solutions uh, again patient identification it's very complex much more complex than for uh, conventional therapies so we, we need to have, uh, in addition to a very strong supply chain uh, capabilities, we need to have this IT system under control. And um, then we have a, a manual bench process. Uh, and uh, sometimes then uh, at the beginning, a lack of GMP understanding uh, that needs to be built up at uh, uh, the manufacturing sites, at new manufacturing sites. We have sometimes semi-closed processes and this is something uh, that we are also constantly um, upgrading uh, to become better. So this is when you start with the first uh, version of something like that, um, then you identify more and more where you need to invest in having better and robust uh, processes, closed, better automized processes. And this is something we are uh, very uh, much engaged to overcome this uh, first uh, hurdles that we ahead from the bench and now we want to become better there and um, also scale up means scale out means uh, that we have uh, often just more operators to, to uh, treat more patients um, and this is also something we want to get rid of by better automation more and more automation you need less operators then you can really scale and don't need to uh, hire all times uh, much more people to have a higher output and last but not least, uh, the, um, the regulatory bodies, they are learning as well with us. Uh, sometimes they are very challenging um, because they have then uh, brand new ideas we need to fulfill. Um, and it's also leading then sometimes to uncertainty for manufacturing at the new sites, because my, maybe China has, uh, the China authorities have different ideas than the Japanese or the Europeans. Sometimes we even have different shelf lives um, accepted by the different authorities, although we are manufacturing globally. And this leads then again to a very complex system. So overall, I would say the learning for us is uh, we need to have more automation, very strong supply chain, um, uh, better um, um, and, and very good interactions with, with authorities to be uh, um, cost efficient at the end so that we can um, also in China pr provide the, uh, to patients on a, on a very good price. Um, and this is, this is not easy with the first version, but I'm convinced that we have with the follow-up um, upgrades, um, very good solutions in place. And still uh, with Kimraya and still the same product, there is a lot of possibility out there. So at the end, uh, thanks for your um, um, presence and uh, listening to me. I just wanted to end with this um, um, slide here where you see each uh, of these uh, uh, lights are representing a patient treated. And we have already uh, several thousand patients treated with Kimraya and hopefully we can continue uh, to help patients globally uh, in the future. Thanks a lot. Many thanks, Alex, for this great talk. And um, now we can take some questions um, and check the question window. Um, well, there's a question on costs of the therapy from Rinaldo Digigov. What are the costs of this therapy and how this kind of therapy can be accessible in poor countries? Yeah, well, um, the costs are um, really heavily depending on uh, the countries. So uh, the labor costs are very different. Uh, I mean, in, in China, you can manufacture uh, cheaper because the labor costs are cheaper. Um, we are also trying to, to lower the costs by uh, lo locally purchasing um, uh, raw materials. But again, this is uh, not that easy because sometimes uh, the materials are simply not available in certain countries. 
So you need them to bring in very uh, high priced product or materials even to China, which makes your pro uh, uh, gives you a problem in the in in, in the local market because uh, uh, you need to to have something that is cheaper. But this is some that these are all all um, points we are need to to work on to be become competitive and also um, uh, can offer a, um, a fair price. But I must say, uh, at the moment, uh, it's very often you see um, uh, the, the final product price, um, uh, it, and it seems quite high. But you, um, um, we should never forget that uh, when you once uh, Kimraya will become a first line therapy, and it's not um, a therapy that is given after um, chemotherapy didn't work anymore or transplant didn't work, then of course this is much more cost efficient because then you have this one-time treatment and you potentially have a complete remission without uh, years of being at the hospital. And then uh, uh, this, this is then um, less of an issue with, with a one-time high price because over time it, it has a, a big benefit. But as I said, uh, we, are, we need to work on uh, a lot on the price, but this is uh, with standardization, it's a very hard and challenging task. Thank you. Um, then we have a question. Are you finding different regulatory bodies are requiring different analytical packages? Yes. Does it lead to different analytical support teams? Does that make the standardization of the submission package difficult? Yes. Yes, we saw that. Uh, Japan was more thorough in, in requesting. Um, they wanted to, to, to know much more what is in the bags um, and to characterize that. Um, so you can always uh, see this also as a chance. Uh, the, more, the more you analyze and generate uh, and data you generate, the more you know about the, uh, the, the, the cells and um, well, when you have uh, an, an outcome, or maybe you can even predict uh, an outcome much better with more data. So it's um, uh, sometimes the requests are quite tough, uh, but yes, and we, we see there are big differences. But on the other hand, you can uh, make also something very positive out of that if you then uh, analyze better and, and, and do some data mining at the end. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we don't have more questions. So let's move on to the last talk for today. Um, Heinrich Haas, Vice President RNA Formulation and Drug Delivery from BioNTech is going to talk about approaches for next generation lipid nanoparticle technologies for RNA delivery. Yeah, so. thank you very much for this kind introduction and thanks to the organizers for giving me the chance to share a little bit more of our technology with the community. Uh, just a question, but my slides are correctly displayed or should I switch something? Um, not yet. Um, it says Heinrich Haas has started screen sharing, double click to enter full screen mode. Well, let me see. Better? No. No. Are you all gone? Could it be an internet connection problem? No, it worked earlier. Let me. Mm -hmm. Here you are. I just. Um... Here we are. Okay. Good. Yeah. Then thanks again for this uh, introduction and. Um, so we switch gears again towards technology as has been uh, presented already uh, from earlier presentations from Peter and, and Lloyd on liposome and uh, lipid nanoparticle manufacturing. Also my presentation will be a bit more technological and I will share with you some, some outcome from our uh, development activities towards improved um, lipid nanoparticle uh, um, technologies for application in, in different therapeutic settings. Uh, so the, the presentation is uh, organized uh, in, in uh, an agenda, as you can see here. So I will give you some introduction in our view on lipid-based RNA 
delivery systems. I will share with you some, some results using polysarcosine as a tool for lipid nanoparticle engineering um, uh, for, uh, for as a substitute for, for pegylated lipids in order to uh, reduce immunogenicity. I will share with you some, some, some structure analyti uh, analytical data and characterization data to uh, investigate and understand these systems. And then I will show you in vitro and in vivo uh, data on, uh, on the systems to demonstrate that they are as active as uh, the, the competitors. And I show you also, uh, demonstrate you also that these are having certain advantages with respect to safety and immunogenicity, which was the original task um, of this approach. So here, let me just move that for a second. Here you see uh, an, an overview of a, of a lipoplex uh, te technologies. And um, you see here basically something like two worlds of lipid-based nanoparticles on the left side. Um, you see what we call a lipoplex, which is formed by uh, incubating liposomes, which are present in aqueous together with RNA. And then you get lipoplexes, uh, uh, where we see a cartoon, how they, they should be organized according to our standing. Um, uh, so here you use liposomes as uh, demonstrated by, by Peter as a starting phase. On the right-hand side, you see uh, um, how you could manufacture LMPs and LMPs, this is now uh, traditionally applied for a certain type of lipid nanoparticles where you start off uh, instead of uh, lipids in water with a, an organic solution of, of lipids where you mix all of the lipids together and you mix directly uh, the, the, the lipids with RNA in, in, in a fast mixing process as, as demonstrated by Lloyd. And you can then come up with, with uh, kind of particles uh, where the cartoon, as you see here, looks a, a little bit different. And uh, actually this cartoon is, is an educated cartoon, so all the structure looks different. Furthermore, you see that uh, the, the lipid selection is a little bit different as well in comparison to the left-hand side, because uh, there are no um, more lipids involved. There's uh, cholesterol, for example, uh, used as a pegylated lipid. We will show you uh, in a minute uh, that you can substitute the, the, the pegylated lipid by a, by a polysarcosinylated lipid. And instead of the permanently charged uh, cationic lipid on the left side, we have here an ionizing lipid, which is considered to be important for the function. So our aim was a little bit to, to um, uh, look a bit beyond this, this, this categorization of, of, of systems and check what, what is the, the underlying characteristics of those and to understand if we can improve them uh, for, for tailoring them for, for an application for, for, for a given task. So uh, for that, um, it is good to have a little bit of, of understanding on how your systems looks like. So characterization is, is, is important. And here I show you how you can use uh, X-ray scattering, small angle X-ray scattering for characterization of the systems. And what you see here is data on um, on characterization of, of uh, uh, model membranes comprising uh, cationic lipids and RNA. This is a very powerful and versatile tool because you can learn quite a lot uh, uh, on these systems. For example, in the diagram, if you look at these scattering curves, you see on the bottom a, a curve with some peaks. These are bread peaks, which gives you a, a lamellar order. And this is pure liposomes, the OPC liposomes, and you see the lamellar spacing of these liposomes. The next curve, we have introduced a little bit of cationic lipid into the liposomes, and you see that the peaks go away. This is because the, uh, the, the, the now charged membranes, they, they uh, uh, exhibit an electrostatic repulsion, and therefore there's no lamellar order anymore, and you only see the form factor of the lipid bilayer. And we will come back to the bilayer in a minute. Now, if you insert RNA in this charged lipids, or if you if you add RNA to this charged lipid, you see that your peaks come back and you see uh, peaks growing with the amount of RNA and they shift also a little bit in position. And overall, you can construct then a model on how these this, uh, um, uh, multi-layer stacks look like and you can get basically quantitative insight in the molecular organization. This looks complicated, therefore I give you a very uh, simplified approach how you can, can analyze this. 
And this is by just looking at these peaks you see here and uh, you would do a, a fitting of a Lorentzian function. You see this uh, at the top right angle to these peaks where you identify the peak position, the peak width and the peak area and they all give you uh, helpful information on the structure of your systems. So the peak position tells you what is the, the, the characteristic spacing between adjacent layers. So it's kind of uh, 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 despacing, while the peak width uh, gives you an information on how many stacks you have in, 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 into your ordered array. So it gives you uh, uh, information on the size of these stacks. And the peak area, if you wish, gives you an information on the amount of material which is uh, present in, in this type of, of uh, uh, ordered organization. So if you wish, you can take it just like a UV measurement where you quantify a certain variety. So it's very simple and straightforward. So and I encourage you to try that at home because it gives you valuable information. So these were uh, uh, examples done with, with this uh, liquid uh, model membrane system. And here you see results from manufacturing uh, these so-called LMPs by basically a very similar uh, technique as uh, 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 demonstrated by Lloyd. We make uh, LMPs where we just substitute the, the pegylated lipid by our polysarcosinylated lipid for reasons of, of uh, certain disadvantages of the, of the PEG lipid, like uh, immunogenicity, uh, it, it impedes cell uptake under certain instances, and there are more disadvantages of the, of the PEG lipids. On the left-hand side, you see size measurements where we write the fraction and the chain length of this uh, polysarcosinylated lipids. And as shown before, where we, uh, the, the size could be uh, uh, affected by changing the flow rate. Here you see that by changing the molar fraction of the crafted lipid, we can uh, sensitively adjust the size of this lipid nanoparticles. And for comparison on the right-hand side, you see data with, with a pegylated equivalent system. Uh, you see as well uh, differences in, in the accessibility of the RNA uh, to intercalating dyes. And uh, um, this is an aspect in which this PSAR systems are different to the, to the pegylated ones. But for all of them, basically, you see that there's a very high binding efficacy of the RNA to the, to the particles. Now we can come to the, to the uh, X-ray scattering data which uh, show a little bit uh, different pattern than the, the ones for the, for the lipoplexus. Uh, there are smooth curves where again, there is a peak for all systems, but this peak is relatively broad and um, uh, unstructured and otherwise the curves are, are, are quite smooth. What you see is uh, scattering curves for, for systems which comprise either polysarcosine or PEC uh, with increasing molar fractions. And you see that this peak continuously decreases the more, uh, the, the, the more crafted lipid we insert into the particles. So somehow this order structure seems to be, uh, to be vanishing with the, uh, with, with the crafted lipid. So you can do quantitative analysis as has been done uh, 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 in, uh, uh, has, uh, according to the other approach I showed you one slide ago. And one, you can see that, uh, for example, the, the peak area goes notoriously down. Apparently, the amount of ordered material goes down. And you see also certain uh, effects on the peak position, while the peak width basically stays the same. What you also can learn from these systems is like uh, um, a, an information on the on the fractal dimension of the particles. What is the fractal dimension? Uh, simply spoken, it can be roughness. So the, the 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 steeper the slope of these curves in this lower region, the the, the smoother the surfaces are. And as the slope uh, becomes uh, uh, lower, so this means the roughness of the particles seems to increase as a function of the higher fractions of the um, of the um, of the crafted lipids. So uh, the question is now here, we see a little bit of different peak pattern as we saw it before for the, for the lipoplexus and what could be the foundation. So the foundation is to our understanding that the, uh, uh, the, the uh, ordered structure 
present in the lipid nanoparticles are way less organized than in the lipoplexis. In other words, we have less uh, 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 ordered uh, 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 scattering units. And here you see a simulation, although this is something you can do easily at home, where on the one hand, we simulated the scattering of a single uh, lipid bilayer uh, by just taking it as, as, as a, as a uh, uniform bar. And this is what people from scattering physics call the form factor. And you would end up in a curve like that. This is what you saw also in the, in, in the earliest uh, um, diagram from the, from the liposomes. If you have ordered structures, you have to take into account the distance between these ordered structures and uh, they lead to peaks uh, uh, with a certain um, uh, spacing. And these peaks, they become the narrower, the more uh, scattering units you aggregate. In our case, what comes out is that you can modulate the, uh, simulate the, the, the scattering pattern easily by just uh, uh, um, adding very few organized units to each other, something like two or three. So the simulation is, is an average of, of an aggregate of, of two or three bilayers with RNA in between. Multiplied, this is what we call the structure factor. You don't need to remember that if you are in this field, but you have to multiply it by the form factor and then you can reproduce many characteristics patterns of this scattering uh, curve. And so you see that in addition to the electron micrographs we saw some minutes ago, you can get a little bit more quantitative information on the internal organization, which may help you to, to uh, take decisions uh, and, and, and fine tune characteristics of the particles. So, so now coming to the, to the activity, which is more be, maybe the, 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 the things which all people are, are interested in. What you see here is um, cell culture experiments where uh, <coughs> types of uh, nanoparticles with uh, increasing mole fractions and chain lengths have um, uh, been formulated with RNA and the transfection efficacy in, uh, in a hepatocyte cell line has been shown, has been, has been investigated. And here, interesting early what you can see while uh, with the PEC system on the right-hand side, you see as expected, the more PEC you add, the, the lower the transfection efficacy because uh, the, the, uh, the PEC kind of uh, prevents the, the, the uptake uh, of the particles by, by the cells. The contrary is the case for many of the polysarcosine systems, which is a great advantage because you can use the, the, the tool for particle engineering and watch the particle in, in the sense to make the particles small, but at the same time, you don't reduce the activity. What you still see here, however, is that the overall activity uh, in the cell culture model for the PSAR system is a little bit lower than the, the, the PEC systems. But, um, if you go to uh, the in vivo setting, you see that uh, still you get a, a, a very good um, activity for this uh, polysarcosine related systems. And again, here the, the crafted moiety has been right in terms of chain lengths and, and uh, molar fractions. And you can see in a nutshell that uh, by, by combining this, this, this uh, these formulation tools, you can at least to a certain extent direct the profile of expression towards either uh, uh, towards different organs, for example, in that case, either to, to uh, uh, spleen or, or to liver, depending on the, on the composition. And you can select uh, best candidates for optimized delivery to, uh, to liver targeting. For example, if you go to this 5% polysarcosine 23, that's the chain length of the polymer of 23 uh, repeat units. So it allows you to come up with basically very similar uh, activities in vivo as the pegylated system. And now as a next step, uh, we have uh, taken this information drawn from the, the fundamental uh, screening with a, with a model system using uh, the ionized lipid dogma and inserted new ionizable lipids like the uh, DLIN mc 3 DMA, which is used in, in, the, in the licensed product in, in, in Patro. And another one, which is, which is an, an, an internal one developed by one of our collaborators. 
And we could show that by this novel ionizer of lipids, we could increase uh, the signal in, in the liver quite a lot and come to way higher signals. In the upper row, you see luciferase. Um, uh, in the lower rows, you see the EPO expression, which is uh, an excreted protein uh, as a function of time. And at least for the EPO, you see uh, quite a nice trend that this novel lipid shows even better activity than the, uh, than the DOTMAR. And both of them, they, they could increase the overall activity by something like a factor of um, 100. So we could tremendously increase the overall signal from this optimized um, formulations. And finally, to come back to the original reason why this uh, polysarcosinylated uh, lipids have been uh, have been chosen, here you see data on uh, investigation of uh, the safety profile by measuring the liver enzymes and uh, the, the cytokine profile. And for both readouts, you can see that uh, the, the polysarcosinylated uh, systems are equivalent or uh, in, in, in principle better than the pegylated systems, which uh, confirm the observation people have uh, made already earlier with liposomes and similar systems that the, 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 the polysarcosinylated nanoparticles can have a way better safety profile uh, than the pegylated ones, and uh, they would allow you to get rid of uh, certain disadvantages uh, correlated to, to the PEC systems. And with that, I would already like to, to, to sum up. And um, so as a conclusion, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, the PSAR lipids can be used as a tool to engineer LNPs or similarly to, to PEC lipids. Uh, and you can modulate all kinds of physical chemical parameters in a controlled manner. And uh, from uh, extended analysis, including SACS, other uh, data I don't show here, you can get a, a very uh, detailed insight into the, 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 the structural organization, uh, the internal organization of these particles. And uh, this can be a basis to correlate them with biological activity, where we could show that we could get a high RNA transfection potency, uh, similar to the pegylated systems, where the trend for an improved safety profile, where by combining these uh, uh, achievements with novel lipids, we could uh, uh, very good signals for liver targeting, as an example, uh, which uh, makes the system as most promising for development of um, novel uh, RNA therapeutics for clinical use where safety profile potentially could be improved or risks allocated to the, uh, to the uh, pegylated systems could be avoided. And with that, I would like to acknowledge all people who have contributed to that. Sarah Nogueira has done most of these experiments in her PhD uh, thesis. Uh, there are further people in uh, our formulation unit. Of course, Uwe Sahin allowed us to do all of that. Uh, we have a tight cooperation with the University Mainz uh, with Peter Langut and Matthias Barz, who is now at the Leiden University. The Dan Peer Group provided the novel lipids, and uh, the people at e EMBL and Biosex Beamline at Daisy Hamburg helped us to do the X ray experiments. With that, I would like to thank you and I'm open for questions. Thanks a lot, Heinrich, for this excellent presentation. Uh, we have a first question here by Michel Schlich on ionizable lipid. Are the SAXS and activity experiments carried out with DOTMA as ionizable lipid? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the first slides showed all, all, all the data all the experiments where we did the optimization of the system were done with, with DOTMA with D as an ionizable lipid. And then we used this optimized composition and manufacturing protocol uh, in order to test a variety of different novel uh, ionizable lipids where we tested much more than the, the ones uh, I could show you here. And the, this MC3 lipid, uh, this we have introduced in effort to have somehow a benchmark with a system which is widely known in the community and it, which is known to give good results uh, as demonstrated in, in many different independent experiments. Okay. 
There's a question on Half-Life. Um, excellent talk. Can you also have long circulating properties with the polysarcosine modified lipid nanoparticles by Michael Keller? Yes, uh, the, the polysarcosine systems also, of course, extend the, uh, the lifetime. If you do a direct comparison, you see that the, 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 um, uh, the half-life in, 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 in blood is a little bit lower for the polysarcosine-related systems. However, we don't, for our system, we don't want uh, a long half-life like with uh, uh, liposomes which comprise cytotoxic agents like toxil, for example. Our uptake, uh, targeting and uptake mechanisms are so fast that uh, we, we can live with, with a much shorter half-life than, uh, in, uh, than uh, these um, um, drug delivery systems with cytotoxic drug uh, require. And by that, we can reduce the, 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 um, the, the shielding, um, uh, the stealth effects, and allow better cellular uptake for the systems. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I have a, a, a simple question. So what are the, uh, let's say, competing rates? I mean, you want to have your um, lipid nanoparticles taken up into your target tissue. I mean, the other cellular uptake mechanisms, are they just outpaced or how can, can we easily understand? Well, I don't know if I understand. The, the question correctly. In principle, for the for, for lipid-based nanoparticles, uh, a large variety of uh, of the injected dose goes to the liver, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore uh, the, uh, that's the reason why there are so many applications for liver targeting with with lipid nanoparticles. Other targets are the spleen, as uh, has been shown uh, here as well. And then there are others like like uh, endothelial cells and so on. But let's say the primary targets are like liver, spleen, lung, where you can then modulate. Uh, and of course, for many applications, it's very important that you can increase the targeting selectivity in order to reduce off-target effects, which can be done by the physical targeting efficacy, but also by mechanisms of cellular uptake. Because you can uh, you can uh, fine tune the, the nanoparticles in the sense that they are not uptaken, or at least not uh, that the RNA is at least not translated by some of the uh, some of the, the organs or some of the cells, which allows you to come up with extremely high targeting selectivity if the systems are fine tuned. Thank you. Just last check for another question. Um, and maybe one more from my side. How can you imagine to go through other routes like even dermal uh, to to use such nano therapies? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, we we do look at uh, different application routes. Let's say uh, our second most important is intramuscular because it's so widespread, particularly for vaccination, which is now important for all this this COVID approaches. We can do also uh, dermal uh, subcutaneous applications and, and other routes um, where um, important is that you always need to, to tailor your delivery system for, for your application route and your cargo. So this means uh, a system which works perfectly well for intravenous uh, delivery to the liver. It may be a mess for intramuscular injection or for subcutaneous application. So this has to be uh, optimized individually. And for that, we do think that this insight into physical chemical coherences can be an advantage in order to, to come faster and more, 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 more efficiently to potential solutions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, we have eight more minutes. Uh, no more question on this uh, talk, but we had a few questions that we couldn't address. So um, let me just go through back. Uh, yeah, there was another question by Michael Keller on LNP IP um, going to the talk from Precision Nano. There were some discussions regarding the IP of LNP technology. Can you comment? Uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so Precision Nanosystems has 
developed proprietary ionizable lipids, uh, as of many other companies as well and institutions. Uh, so I guess I can't comment per se on IP because I'm not a intellectual property lawyer, but I think it's important to have uh, freedom to operate as you're developing these nanoparticle formulations. Okay, thank you. There's another one for you uh, from ARD. A very nice presentation. Is the complete fluid path in precision nanosystems, including the mixer and the pump, single use for the GMP systems? Yes, it is. And it's designed for single use, uh, so it can be prepared, uh, flushed, uh, used, and then taken off, and then a new fluid path can be, uh, can be placed on the system. So yeah, everything is single use from the pump heads uh, to the microfluidic mixer and all the tubing and connection. Okay, thank you. Then there is another one by an absolute uh, corporation limited. The liposome as a drug or vaccine delivery system is difficult to manufacture, isn't it? Uh, what is the limiting process of liposome manufacturing and how to solve this limitation? I think it basically it's a scientific understanding of of what it takes for a, a particle to self-assemble. So we're, and most people are predominantly using self-assembling technologies or bottom-up technologies, and really controlling all of the different uh, parameters that are involved with particle formation, your solvent concentration, uh, how the your nucleic acid is mixed with your lipid nanoparticle, uh, your lipid components, uh, ionic strength, pH, if you use an ionizable lipid, there are many, many factors uh, that you need to consider. Uh, and, and it's probably good to map that out uh, as you develop a, a formulation, because uh, you're ultimately going to have to scale that up. So to get an understanding early on uh, in the formulation, uh, the formulation side of things, formulation uh, development is critically important because you want to start with a scalable, with anything you do, you want to start with a scalable process. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's various options. And I think PNI provides a good option for that. Yeah, many thanks. Uh, then there is another question from Absolute to Wouter uh, about the future trend of new modalities. What is the research and market trends for nanomedicine for the near future? Oh, that's quite a broad question to answer. Maybe I can link it to just oral, oral delivery um, I think that the trend is, is more and more towards trying to get these larger models already available. And we see it a lot. We see that, that we started away from the classical small molecules and all bodies, space modality coming up with challenges that are, that are related to oral availability. So, but I could at least say in that area where we see a trend that more and more technology being are coming up and also being tried out like these uh, not straightforward microneedle technology. There is a room for that all of a sudden that didn't used to be there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what other questions do we have on the chat? Oh, there was an earlier one. Can there be selective delivery to lower intestine? Directed to me? Yeah, it's not directed. Okay. <laughs> um, what time was it? Oh. Eleven eighteen, and we were ten minutes late. So that was yeah, that would that would fit. Um, of course, you can. I mean, depending a bit on on how you you code your your potential capsule. There are some technologies out there that specifically target towards the colon. I wouldn't see why you could not uh, target there with any other thing. Okay. Um, then there was another question by Magdalena Obazanik. Um, thank you, Walter, for this nice overview. Would the alternative insulin delivery method you have shown, uh, could it reduce frequency of drug intake? 
Um, I think you might be referring to the slide with the ionic liquid, but we saw that the response remained longer than the subcutaneous injection. Um, based on that, you would think that it might be possible. We have to see a bit what's going on there. It can also be the dose is much higher. It can be that it's slower leaking out or slowly or slowly are being absorbed and therefore having a longer effect. Um, so it could be at the same time, I'm not really sure if insulin is the right product for an oral uh, oral bio or for, for to deliver orally. I mean, you, you need it relatively quick. I think it's used a lot in studies because it's such an easy tool to study. You just measure blood glucose and, and that will give you your pharmacodynamic effect. So I think many of these studies are just for, for ease of studying insulin issues, but I would not see that becoming a marketed product for oral bio for oral, de oral delivery. Thank you. And then another one, what is the maximum size of peptide that can be transported orally? It's a bit hard to say, it depends a bit on the technology. I mean, we saw several now having an effect from insulin that is uh, about six kilo delta or around 50, 50 amino acids to oxyreotide, which is eight amino acids. They all work um, at the same time. There's data available for monoclonal antibodies being post orally and found back in the systemic circulation. So I don't think it's a matter of size. It will be a matter of dose. I think the larger the molecule or the higher the dose needed, the higher the challenge will be. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, there's one more. Um, um, thank you uh, from Magdalena Obersanik. Thank you, Walter. It would definitely be of interest to patient to have oral delivery of insulin. Okay. I'm sure it will. Yeah. So very exciting thanks a lot for your great presentations and the lively debate um, so i enjoyed this a lot and i hope um, we can have you again at future meetings um, i think for me personally these all these uh, new modalities have changed the pharmaceutical uh, choices quite a bit and uh, i think we will see pretty quick what is um, enabling new solutions for the patients. Thanks a lot and bye-bye for now.